Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to your own Silicon Valley Tech Talks channel. This is your host Faisal Vertu from Santa Clara, California. In today's episode of Silicon Valley Tech Talks, we'll continue our exploration in the exciting world of semiconductor industry. I'm here at HQ Incorporated head office. HQ is one of few open semiconductor companies which are trying to reconstitute the 5G infrastructure with ease and affordability of Wi-Fi. HQ has developed world's first 5G plus AI base station on chip solution, enabling service providers to build, configure, and deploy 5G public and private networks. We're fortunate to have Vinay Ravuri as our guest today. Vinay is CEO and founder of HQ. He's a longtime visionary in semiconductor industry, and before HQ, he held executive leadership roles at Qualcomm and Applied Micro. So without any further delay, let's go and talk to Vinay and learn from his insights. Hi Vinay, welcome to our show. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, how are you? Good, good, thank you. So Vinay, for decades, we didn't have many semiconductor startups in cellular 4G, 5G space, and Silicon Valley is proud to have a startup based in the Valley, and we thank you and team for that. So for our audience, can you briefly explain what core problem HQ is solving, and how are you different from the other players offering products towards a cellular infrastructure? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. You know, Silicon Valley, there's silicon in, in, in that name, but not as many silicon companies anymore. Uh, you know, Valley grew really out of, uh, out of uh, developing silicon uh, historically. Particularly in cellular, that's a very good question because, you know, if you look at the history of, of semiconductor companies, Integration and uh, pulling in multiple functions into a single chip is something that has happened in many places. Like you take the phone. Originally, phone didn't have all the things that phone chips have today. If you look at it as a modem, it has a CPU, it has a GPU, or a massive amount of integration happened. And that's why you're able to get this phone that is, some people say, a supercomputer in your, in your hand. Uh, if you look at a server, it's just a very similar idea. You know, in the past, there was not a concept of an SOC there. It's like you've got a bunch of CPU cores, and then you had memory controllers that were separate. You had I.O. that was separate. So that innovation slowly took place. Cellular, that hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, there are two issues here. One is there are not that many companies that do cellular, period, to begin with. Second is this uh, innovation cycle hasn't really gone through, cellular hasn't gone through that much of that cycle. So we found a, an interesting problem to solve, which is how do we take a something like a base station, and combine a bunch of components into massively integrate into a single chip. And in, by doing that, reduce power, cost, and all, you know, flex, increase flexibility. And this is something that we thought of in 2018. Now we're seeing the results of it because we have a chip and people are actually seeing that there's a huge difference between us and competition as a result. So that's really the reason that we did this is that we found that there isn't that much innovation in this space and we thought we could do a better job. So essentially, uh, no other player is offering base station on chip solution? So there's uh, you know, in, in interesting uh, thing about uh, infrastructure, cellular infrastructure, is that a lot of them are vertically integrated. If you look at like Ericsson, Nokia, those types of companies, uh, they, uh, some of them do their own chips. So when they do their own chips, they customize it for themselves. In those scenarios, they do integrate a lot of components. But as a merchant silicon, silicon company selling to anybody out there, they don't. They don't integrate. Um, baseband is by itself for the most part, and CPUs are separate, NPUs are separate, timing functions are separate. So there's a bunch of these functions that go into a base station. They're all put together with the cobbling a bunch of chips uh, and then building a base station, whether it's a small cell or a macro cell. You talked about cellular, and I know that HQ is quite bullish on 5G, but there's also a perception that 5G is nothing more than a marketing term. So in your view, what are all those meaningful ways in which 5G adds value beyond 4G? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and some of it is actually true. If you look at 4G, 3G, uh, you know, these Gs are in introduced every 10 years or so. 4G, the killer use case was video streaming. If you look at 3G, uh, iPhone was really the thing that enabled a lot of web browsing. With 5G, there was 
two aspects to it. One is the uh, evolutionary part, which is just to extend 4G for better coverage experience, if you will. And then there was a revolutionary part, okay? So the evolutionary part is the same use cases, just a little bit better. I call that 4.9G. It's really 4G, maybe a little bit better. The revolutionary part is where it departs from just a cell phone use case, and it goes into applications that are oriented towards um, uh, digitization, like automation, uh, whether it's a factory or something like uh, AR, VR in a, uh, in a venue setting. Um, it could be a campus network like this where you're extending coverage, um, or it could be um, a warehouse where their robots are, are you know, picking and dropping uh, packages, uh, the, uh, or drones is another one people may uh, refer to. So these are these require different kind of specification, different la latencies, different reliability uh, metrics. Uh, the issue is that this is the revolutionary part. Um, the revolutions just don't happen right away. It takes time for this sort of thing to get accepted. So as a result, so far what we have seen in 5G is only the evolutionary part. It's just extending the, the traditional phone network, Not nothing more has happened yet. So in that sense, the, uh, you know, the half full, glass half full is that a large part of the, of the vision uh, of 5G is ahead of us. Not, it, it hasn't come to fruition yet. Uh, but there was a lot of hype. So when there's hype, it's hype. A lot of people expect it tomorrow, but it didn't happen. You know, much like you know, like if you think about uh, uh, wearing wearables or um, headsets or metaverse, there was a lot of hype, but that these things take a, a long time for, for it to come true. I know that in the HQ portfolio, there are solutions for small cells. Uh, I want to ask you a follow-up question specifically on small cells. At the time of 4G, we heard a lot of talks about small cells, but we all saw that small cells did not take off the way uh, we anticipated. So what is fundamentally changing in 5G? Why would the small cell story be different this time around? Yeah, uh, look, we looked at this particular problem or the question when we started the company. Um, small cell has always been next year. <laughs> it's gonna be big next year. And it's been that way for 10 years uh, or more. Um, so originally, something like 4G or even 3G, the idea of small cell was that instead of having these large base stations that need a cell tower, a lot of power, perhaps there is an application and there is a better total cost of ownership if you just put in a bunch of smaller cells. Um, the idea here is that can we just insert smaller cells and, and then make the coverage better, in, particularly in a dense environment. That was the thinking. It turns out that it's not that simple. The reason is it costs a lot of money to go install things. And it's not up to, it, it, AT&T can't just decide I'm gonna go and densify the network and install things. They have to get approvals from uh, utility companies. There's a lot of regulatory mun municipalities. So there's a lot of regulatory issues. You know, if you're in a neighborhood, maybe I don't want a base station overlooking, you know, my bedroom. <laughs> so so, so it's, it, it gets to be a bit more complicated. Um, and more than anything is the, the business case. They thought it would be, there would be a business case for it. There's an ROI for it. it turns out there wasn't. Uh, I think that's something that is kind of accepted at this point for for regular run-of-the-mill uh, 5G small cell world. It's not zero. There's some volume here. Then now 5G. Is this any different? Okay. Again, going to the evolutionary part, I don't see it being that different. I think it's just the same kind of thing. Maybe you'll get a little bit more. The revolutionary part is interesting. Um, uh, there is... The, that's the an indoor type of application, as I mentioned before, right? You know, if it's a campus network or a, um, a, a venue type of assist, uh, setting, you are now talking about something that is got to be indoor. You can't put a big cell tower inside, and and it's also management wise, it's managed by an enterprise, managed by an IT person. So the, it has to fit the power envelope, 
cost envelope, simplicity of managing that thing like Wi-Fi. So, so that is small cell, like Wi-Fi is a small cell, right? So, so there is that part. Um, now that hasn't happened yet, right? But we do see a lot of interest now. If, I, if you were to ask me, if I, if I look at all the RFPs and look at the customer interest, I see more small cell indoor than I see outdoor. There is one exception to all of this, is this thing called millimeter wave. Now, if you, if you deploy something with millimeter wave, uh, the path loss is high, meaning the signal doesn't go too far, so you have to install uh, many of them. The thought was that in 5G, that would force a lot of small cells. Well, it turned out millimeter wave didn't pick up as much either. So that also killed the, the outdoor um, uh, small cell uh, uh, vision. But, but that's not to say that it's dead forever, temporarily. Uh, eventually, these things will, will take place. HQ claims to have a natively integrated 5G plus AI solution. Traditionally, we have seen that AI has been more applicable to software products, consumer applications, and so on, rather than hardware products. So can you explain us what's the role of AI here? Right. So first, AI mm. fundamentally is implemented in hardware, right? You got to have hardware. You have a $1 yeah. trillion dollar company called NVIDIA that yeah. basically made a whole company around it. Uh, but I, I understand your question. It's that applications are very software oriented. Mm -hmm. What does a chip that's coming from HQ have to do with AI? And this was also one of these very basic things we looked at when we started the company. It turns out the machine learning actually fundamentally, mathematics-wise, didn't, didn't get invented from something else. It did come from this area, which uh, a dot product, which is fundamental to uh, inference or even training, is nothing but multiplying two matrices and adding things. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, it's actually the same thing in communication. There's a thing called uh, convolution. In, in, a, in an interesting way, machine learning took a lot of the mathematics that was used in, in, uh, in wireless or information theory. Now, we, meaning wireless folks, are seeing these machine learning models are so good, they can also be used to make wireless communication better. Uh, you know, channel estimation is a good example of that. You can estimate the channel using traditional approach or you can run it using a neural network. There is spectrum management, RF-oriented uh, things. You can do things with users, like predict what, you know, which user is likely to ask for a grant. There's a lot of interesting ideas like that. So, so our thing is, can we implement better 5G using machine learning? So that was one. Second is, as machine learning applications themselves are, you know, uh, they mature, take an example for a camera that is, you know, CCTV type of camera. Maybe the camera is really dumb. Maybe it doesn't have in, in enough uh, uh, compute power. And they all get aggregated into a base station because it's wireless, right? Say, okay, whether it's Wi-Fi or, or 5G. Uh, then that runs an inference, like streetlights have that, right? And streetlights can communicate uh, so whether it's street lights or even like traffic lights. That camera can now communicate with a base station. And that base station can run inference. And, and that inference is machine learning. So it's a computer vision application running closest to the, to the data. So that's where we come in. You don't necessarily have to go and put another chip, another box, another system. And it's also very secure, right? Because it's, it's inside the chip. So these are the, this is the vision of it. Again, this is not the traditional 5G, this is sort of the revolutionary part of 5G. So modems are uh, one of the most complicated semiconductor products to design. Uh, complexity apart, faster speeds, lower costs, smaller size, these continue to be the key requirements of semiconductor products, whether you're talking about mobile or base stations. In next five to 10 years, are we expecting any disruptive innovations in semiconductor architecture? For example, we are hearing about Risk Five. Can that be a game changer? Yeah, no, it's also a very good question. Um, so the, the pace of innovation is just accelerating in every field. Um, so we're seeing that even in, uh, in communications. Uh, I do see two 
specific areas within communication. Uh, one is use of uh, technology like RISC V, um, uh, where you can modify the instructions yourself and add accelerators and still kind of make this look like it's a software defined uh, modem. Uh, so that's one area. So as a result of that, you can now easily add different protocols. You know, you can make it 6G without revamping the whole uh, whole uh, chip. The other uh, area that I, I see a lot going on is that there's so much, as I said, focus and uh, interest in machine learning. And I do see the future of this industry taking advantage of that a lot more. It's not just running neural networks. People may, you know, as soon as someone says neural network, I mean, machine learning, they think neural networks. Think of it as how these things are actually implemented. If you look at a chip of a machine learning chip, there's a, a lot of memory and there's a lot of compute coupled together very tightly because memory bandwidth is a big issue. IO bandwidth is an issue because the amount of data that you're trying to process or these the number of weights you're talking about, something like LAMA, like 70 billion weights, right? Uh, parameters. So, so there's good innovation going on there. There's you know analog computing. There's in-memory compute. These are things that are where memory and compute are so close to each other. I do see the chip technology itself that's been being pioneered there, being used. Those technologies, techniques, whatever you want to call the ideas used also in the cellular world. Um, you know, whenever you have an, a very concentrated air, uh, focused area, there's always great ideas that come out of it. And those ideas can be used somewhere else. And I do think that there is combination of, like I said, risk five and these other things. A lot will change in the next few years, I think. Vinay, you are a forward thinker, spearheading transformation of new ideas into tangible realities. And you have done that at startups and also in big companies. Will you share any guidance for new professionals and entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting new initiatives or companies? Yeah. Uh, you know, if, just reflecting on my own self, I, I wish I had done what I'm doing way sooner, way long time ago. Maybe not specifically 5G, but doing a venture of my own. So I would say the first thing is start young. Um, the younger you are, the more risks you'll take. Uh, you're willing to take and are also it's easier to take them, less responsibilities as, a, as an individual. I have two quotes that I always think about in life and they're both by the same guy, Steve Jobs. One of them is in a speech that he made in, uh, at uh, Stanford. He said, you know, I think he closed the speech with, stay young and stay foolish. I would say that's key. No matter how old you are, try to stay young and stay foolish. That is, uh, will, it, it powers me every day. Uh, it, it just makes me live life uh, a little bit more. The second quote that I, I really, and it's not as well known quote, it's also by Steve Jobs. He says this very interesting thing. He says this, that the world that's been created uh, and the rules and what you follow is created by people that are no smarter than you. If you know that and really internalize it, then life will never be the same. That's what he says. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's what I also believe in is that the rules around you know what can be done what cannot be done what's possible what's impossible these are all created by people who are no smarter than you so combining with that first quote and this one i think completely changes everything i don't really look at the world the same way anymore you know who is some you know so when someone says hey this is a hard thing really why is it so hard you know, what makes you say that it's hard and why should I accept that? Um, look, we are HQ, small company. We're competing with somebody like Qualcomm in big companies like that. For most part, people say, that's crazy. Are you crazy to do that? But, but again, it's done by people that are no smarter than I am. So why not? Well said, Vinay. Thank you so much for joining our show. Yeah. I'm sure our audience would have learned a lot from your insights. No, thank you. Thank you for having me.